<laughs> All right, thanks, Mr. Chairman, for the introduction. As explained, the AIT does applied research, so we are very much uh, oriented towards the industry. We cooperate with them in, in the innovation cycle, as we call it. Uh, we try to bridge the gaps between research and, and, and implementation. So things should appear on the market and all the risk and all the uncertainties are expected to be overcome by, by applied research institutes and the AIT is one of them. Um, the group that I'm leading is, so before I was leading a, a very large group, about 50 people about um, sustainable buildings. So we were optimizing buildings and their performance in thermal way, electrical way and all these things. But now I'm, I'm uh, setting up a very small high profile team on energy systems, complex energy systems. And we try to understand these systems. So how to model them, how to efficiently simulate them. And this is a bit of an orthogonal uh, move currently. Uh, might be of use for industry, might be of use for smart grids, might be of use for buildings. And we are trying to solve the, the fundamentals of this. My talk today is about demand response. That means what can we do on the load side? Or what, what was called load side in previous times. Um, I would like to start with a project that I like. I like it because we're part of it. And that's in Denmark, a little, a little island called Bornholm. Electrically, it's connected to, some of you know that. <laughs> <laughs> Electrically, it's connected to, uh, to Sweden with three underground cables of about this thick, less, apparently. And uh, the Bornholmians are very peculiar. They are joining every energy research topic that you can imagine. and so. Uh, it's a perfect site to try out things and there's a big uh, uh, European consortium doing another project there, it's called EcoGrid and uh, there's industry involved, IBM, Siemens and the usual suspects and of course DTU and uh, Energinet DK and, and so on. So that's a, a large consortium, a large project and it has a couple of very ambitious goals. First is um, to increase the autonomy of that island because it's quite funny, if you look at the, at the satellite, you see the ships going by, and then they make a turn, like this, and then <coughs> and they go on again. What happens? They have forgotten to pull in their anchor, and it's dragged on the ground, and eventually it catches the underground cables, and then it goes like this, and then, <coughs> then it's tearing the cable, and then it can't go on. And then the lights go out at Bornholm. So that's how that happens every two years and people would like to change that. And that is one of the motivations for, for that project. So the goals are quite ambitious. So they try to integrate all kinds of different things like the power matcher, you might have heard about this, the Siemens DEM systems and, and the cell control line and all, the, all that stuff. Um, to combine intelligent generation with a, with a more smarter load site. It's a demonstration project, so mainly demonstration and implementation. And one part is the intelligent demand side. So that's the focus of our talk today. So what would that mean? You can, you can do two things. First is make, an, make the load side intelligent for the, for the grid, for the electric grid. You can do frequency support and voltage support by intelligently managing the loads. You, you, could, you could activate reactive power in distributed generation, like uh, modern inverters can do that, PV inverters for instance, and with this you can support the voltage. You could schedule a generation. See if you have one power line, like five wind stations at the end, and the capacity is only there for three of them, and all of them want to feed in, what do you do? Yeah? So there must be fairness so you can have a kind of round robin uh, schedule for that probably. And again, can of course have cooperative loads so they can shift and shed if, if the grid is overloaded. So this is purely electrical, technology, cool. The second aspect is the market. Um, you could react on prices. So if there is a peak period, you can, you can plan, even, especially when you have a forecast. If you know the prices in advance, 
you might do pre-cooling, preheating, and whatever you do with your energy to switch that off during the expensive phase. Um, you can increase the penetration of renewable generation with this flexibility. So you can react on the fluctuating uh, feeding. And you, in general, you increase the demand elasticity. So that's a macroeconomical uh, phenomenon. So these two things uh, have to be kept in mind when we talk about an intelligent load side. That's the market. Well, that's a very simplistic <laughs> view on the market um, mechanisms. So it's a demand supply curve. And whenever you influence the demand, you have an influence on the price. Not always, because there's a certain threshold. It has to be exceeded before it's felt in the market. So small changes don't really uh, cause anything. But uh, starting from a certain size, uh, this, this becomes visible. And if you have a flat rate, people are just consuming whatever they want because it doesn't matter. Yeah? Once people have the choice and the ability to, to feel the price, it gets, it gets interesting. So this, this, this would be a, a free market, a good market that is self-stabilizing. And if you add demand side management and demand response capabilities to to the electric load side, you will flip that curve in that direction. And the system gets more balanced. So that at least is the romantic um, expectations that we have. Of course, the market is much more complicated, unfortunately. The electric side, so the other part is, um, that's just a, a, a small aspect of it. Voltage stability, especially in, in the rural areas where you have a power line going into some valley, and well, then it's over. And in the end of the valley, you have all these photovoltaics on the tourist huts. Nowadays, you get a voltage problem. So you leave your boundaries. The voltage has some security or safety boundaries. And you have to keep the voltage on the entire feeder line in that boundary. And whenever you drain out something out of it or you feed something in, you move the voltage. Yeah? Very, very simple. You can do this with a DC analysis even. So, the lines were dimensioned with the hierarchical uh, production topology in mind. So big power stations and it, 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 uh, it's distributed into uh, thinner and thinner power lines, like a tree. And now we have the power stations on the leaves of the tree. So this is a very uh, uh, unfortunate situation, so we have to deal with this. So we have to figure out how to reduce power and, and, and keep the voltage in its limits. So you can, you can change the tap uh, transformers, of course, but you also have to do something at the distributed energy resources. So these are the two things <coughs> that are important. And this project, this funny project, tries to combine that somehow. Huh? Here we have the more technological part, quick response on certain events. Um, you see all these primary, secondary, tertiary control here, uh, spinning reserves in inertia. That's more the technology. Here's more the, the market, where prices are uh, generated based on certain mechanisms. And the EcoGrid project tries to put some real-time market in the middle that takes economical aspects and technological aspects into consideration. So it's a mixed marketplace, something completely new. And it's a demonstration project. So we do, we demonstrate it without knowing if it, if it works. That's, that's the most funny thing about it. So if you say demand side management, it means doing anything at the, at the load side. Changing the light bulbs to more efficient ones is demand side management. Changing the, the building shell or improving the building shell by adding insulation is demand side management. Yeah? But that's more in the, in the efficiency part. So it's you optimize it, you improve the efficiency by adding better material, better equipment, and all these things. On the right side of this, of this picture, we have more the, the quicker things. So you react on, either you have tariffs where you have a high price period in the day, or you have more dynamic, uh, instantaneous,
crisis up to events they ahead or instantaneous. So you have to react on something. The grid operator or the utility um, broadcasts an, an emergency event. This is more the elect electric part again. So that's, that's the categories of, of, of demand response that we're working with. And the funny thing is that things tend to move to the left side. So if you go to a customer and install some smart box that reacts on, on prices or on, on, on emergency signals, and the, the customer gets a refund for this, like 10 euros per, <coughs> per reaction. It takes like two or three months, then the customer says, I, I'm doing this like four days a week, uh, four days a, a year, four times a year, and get uh, 40 euros out of this. Why don't I do this every day? So I get 10 euros every day. And then this, the strategy moves to the left side, so you try to implement it on a more permanent basis. So the quick ones, the signals, again have these two um, categories. The price response, you broadcast some price, maybe a wholesale market price, and you try to reduce the peak load. Yeah? Um, what you get out of this is you, you usually save money. Yeah? Maybe CO2 because the peak energy is maybe more dirty than the ground, uh, the, the base load. Uh, yeah. Reliability response is more the electrical part where the DSO or the TSO broadcasts a, a call for help and everybody who is, who is subscribed um, might react. The measure of success is some, some incentive from the TSO or, or of the DSO, the distribution system operator and transmission system operator. So they give you money for being part of that. That's an example that we implemented. Um, that was in California. The, the, the utilities typically were calling on a telephone facility operators of factories and large office buildings <coughs> if they anticipate some problem in the future. The, the forecast was highly accurate, to be honest. So they knew exactly in two days, at two o'clock in the, in the afternoon, we will have an overload. They knew this exactly. Yeah. So they called this guy and told him, please reduce your cooling load by 50% between one and three o'clock in the afternoon in two days, and you will get a refund. Yeah. And this never worked. So 95% of the times that guy was not there, he forgot it, the facts got lost, whatever. So the human in the loop was the main problem in this, in this application. So what did we do? We replaced the human, of course, um, with a very simple system. So we had a server with a database. Customers can subscribe there to certain programs at the, as they were called, different types of products from the DSO how often they are called and yeah. and the, the utilities and DSOs could issue the request to that, to that server and the server forwards it to the customers where it's automatically processed by the control system, either the billing automation system or the factory uh, uh, resource management system and these things. So it's fully um, electronic based on open standards, SOAP, XML, service-oriented architecture and, and these things. So an example is this one where we have a very um, simple bidding. So the, the system operator places a, an offer into the system. I would like to reduce, I would, I would like to have reduced um, uh, 50 kilowatts and I would pay $500 for it. And then the customers can, can place their bids. I have five kilowatts, I have 10 kilowatts, and I want this, and I want this, and this. So this is a one-stage bid, so it's not a negotiation, and like in Sotheby's or whatever. So it's one step, and then it's decided. So very simple. And customers can also opt out if they don't want. So it's very, very democratic. That was extremely important in California. Once you make some kind of remote control, people freak out. 
So they want to have full control over, over their facilities always. So it's the psychological part of this. Um, an example from Austria that we did at the University of Technology um, with cooling devices. So process cooling in industry or refrigerators or air conditioning systems. Typically, um, these graphs, they show the nominal power and the nominal frequency of the device. Yeah? Typically, you have 50 hertz and maybe one kilowatt. <coughs> and all the devices, that's the blue spots, they consume the nominal power around the nominal frequency. Yeah? Whatever the frequency is, they, they, they consume that. The ideal device, in the eyes of the, of the grid operator, would be the black one. Yeah? Reduce less power if the frequency is too low, and consume a bit more power if the frequency is too high. Yeah? So we added this little box, quite, quite simple thing. Um, it was a, a $1 80 mega CPU inside and a GSM module, a couple of relays, and one page of C code was enough to make that behavior. Yeah? So statistically, the, the devices were much more cooperative. So when the grid was in need, in this part, they were backing off, and when if, if there was too much energy in the grid, they were consuming more. So they're changing the set points, by cooling down a bit more and, and these things. Still keeping the process parameters into certain limits, of course, otherwise you would uh, uh, violate some process limits. Other examples. Um, the grid-friendly controller from the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, uh, already is like six years old. Um, is something similar like the iron box that I showed before. It's a dedicated piece of silicon that does pretty much the same thing. It reacts on a frequency, but it does not communicate. So it's much cheaper um, because it ha doesn't have a, 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 a GSM modem inside. Um, but the fairness and, and that is not that easy if you don't communicate. So they have sophisticated scrambling and, 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 and randomizing algorithms inside to keep that thing stable. And it's commercialized, so uh, companies are already licensing this thing. Knife system in Japan is uh, the other side. It's a <laughs> big, big heavy box utility technology that you can put in a rack that does a similar thing. It connects to some servers and tries to organize uh, consumption in uh, um, air conditioning systems. Aggregators do something similar, that's more a commercial thing. They equip their customers with some of these technologies and sell the flexibility that they generate at the customer site. So they aggregate these little pieces of flexibility of shifting and shedding and they sell it in big quantities on the power market. So they are trading um, the degrees of freedom of their customers. Yeah? The orb, that's my favorite. <laughs> I, I had this in my office, yeah? a little glass ball. It was given away for free from uh, Pacific Gas and Electric, that's the utility company in, in the Silicon Valley. And it looks very nice. So, so you would buy this at uh, Ikea or some, some interior outlet. It's uh, satinated glass and you could plug it in the power. Yeah? And then it, it glows in some color. And depending on the frequency, it would change its color. So usually it's green or blue, and, and the utility company tells you if it's green or blue, then everything is fine. Huh? But if it changes to yellow or red, then things are getting really dangerous. So that's, all, that's the only thing that they tell you. Huh? And they give it to you for free. <laughs> and the result was that people had this in the living rooms or offices, and because they liked it. And when it started to get yellow or red, they were turning down the air conditioning. So here, 
they explicitly brought the human back into the loop. Yeah? So they didn't define the people as part of the problem, but part of the solution. And that's the nice thing about it. Because people are not stupid. They, they can think, and if you let them contribute, they will do so. The PCT, another uh, peculiar story in California, uh, a thermostat with communication capabilities. So you see this green, r yellow, and red thing, and it's basically the same thing. And you can, you can uh, program it in a way that it changes the set point when it gets yellow or red. Hmm? So people didn't like it because they thought it's a remote sensing control big brother device of the evil, evil utility companies. They are extremely uh, sensitive to these things and it was kicked out of the building code. They tried to have it in the building code so that every new building is obliged to install these things. So, obligatory. Um, I, I had a smart AC at home that was a, a poor man's version of that. So it just switches off if there is a radio broadcast signal. So <laughs> the utility company just broadcast something and puck, my air conditioning was switched off. And there was a refund, so get money for that. And that's the most funny thing. That I, I think everybody heard about that last year, the, the 50.2 hertz problem. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the code for the, for the photovoltaic inverters in Germany contained a little, a little paragraph that said, if the frequency is above 50.2 hertz, it should switch off or it should back off from the grid. That sounds reasonable and good, yeah, because if they're feeding in too much, uh, they should uh, also join the, the game of grid frequency control. But on the, <laughs> the problem was that there's so much PV in Germany. I mean, in the, in the distribution grid alone, there is 10 gigawatts and that's 17 gigawatts in total. And if 10 gigawatts just back off at the same time, you can imagine what happens. <laughs> and, and, the, and the TSOs are only allowed to, to switch on three gigawatts at once to solve the problem, but this will not solve the problem because there are still maybe five missing. So that was, uh, I don't know how, how that can happen. I mean, all the other examples are like five, six years old where all that was already solved that you don't just back off it slowly and distribute it and, and these things. Anyway, they changed it. Now the new code of 2012 already has a passage that they don't switch off, but they ramp it out and that so should be much more softer now. But that's the point. If you have distributed control without any um, model behind it, without any coordination, you get exactly this. Yeah? Oscillations. So, load management. We, we've seen a couple of examples now, some of them very automated, some of them with humans in the loop. Um, if you have this in a large scale, you get a lot of problems actually. The commissioning is very complex. You, thousands of parameters. I have um, backup slides if you still have time in the end, which I don't believe. Um, where you can see that it's really complex to commission these things, hundreds of parameters that you have to type into a, a DSM system that it really works. There is no planning, there is no pre-cooling usually, it just hits you and that's it. Um, there is no model and, and self-organization is virtually zero. You have to configure it. Yeah? And this is not the way how it, how it will work. This is just playing around now. If you really roll it out, we have to solve these things. So we have to have better algorithms we have to have self-organization there. And of course we need a process model because otherwise the controls are just very limited. <coughs> I think, can you explore a little bit more on this? I mean, this is very fast now. This is the center of the workshop. So yes. Could you go back to the previous slide, maybe? I mean, you just said we need self-organization, but I think um, it would be nice if you could, let's say, elaborate on this a bit more. Why do we need this and, you know, to what extent? Uh, yeah. This is not the core of my presentation, but I can certainly talk about that. We need self-organization on two levels, more or less. First one is the, the network management part, maybe. So devices need to register themselves. There sh should be uh, information security without uh, typing in some codes and sending out SIM cards. There must be something much more easier that devices can join a community of energy relevant entities in a more or less pain less way 
um, if we are in industry and we just have like five or six or 10 or 20 nodes that are important, like the chiller and the, the, the melting pot and, and, and the air conditioning and, and some conveyor belt, then it might be still possible that somebody goes there manually, has a look at the process, how it works, where are the correlations in the consumption, um, and do it manually. But when we think about larger systems where we step by step lower the entry point in terms of size up to a time when even my shaver is part of an energy management system, uh, then we get into numbers. That's the first thing that make it impossible to configure it manually. And also the stakeholders involved. All these things belong to different um, persons and companies and legal entities. And you would need to do contracts with everybody um, to make sure everything is clear when something goes wrong. Yeah? Things can go wrong and if, if that happens everybody blames each other. So that must be absolutely clear that this system gets along without a system administrator that hops around the country and, and configures everything every day, 24 seven. And without these complicated contracts, it should be much more a bottom up approach, a self emerging um, cooperative system. So that's the, the network part. The second part is the, the application itself, the controls. Um, we, I mean, the, the energy system is not bad. It runs since 100, of year, uh, since 100 years and it's highly optimized. The power stations are highly optimized and the controls. The infrastructure is quite good, at least in Europe, not so in other countries. Um, it's centralized. So you have this unidirectional power flow, usually at least in the distribution network still. Um, this will very likely change. It will not change to a completely distributed system because we will not tear away all the power lines, all the transmission lines. They were unbelievably expensive and they are very good. So that's an asset. You, we, we will not destroy that. And the grid is something very um, useful if you want to trade energy and if you want to transport it from the offshore wind park down to Klagenfurt. Um, so there will be a mixture between a centralized and a decentralized architecture. The point is that the decentralized elements will need to respect the market rules and the control rules in this system. And that's again something that is currently done manually. There is a limited number of players in this game. All of them are experts, all of them know what to do. And this is why it works. If now thousands and millions of new nodes and new players join, we need to figure out how they react. It's a multi-objective situation. In the end, it boils down probably to money. People are not much interested in CO2 and, and, and other uh, philanthropic parts. So you, you, you would need to project all the things that you want to have optimized, like the grid management and the renewables and, and, and the carbon footprint. You have to project that somehow onto money and make sure that these market rules, and that's the really complicated part, that these market rules really lead to a collective behavior that satisfies your initial demands, your initial needs. Of course, every market, rules, every market rule can be exploited and, and the individuals, of course, they will look for their own benefit. So you would need to make sure that the individual benefit is very near to the collective benefit. So that's the two parts that I see in self-organization, the, the technological networking thing has a lot with management, information security, uh, intrinsic resilience. So you also have to take into consideration what happens if I have an, a, have an attack or a natural catastrophe, how does the system reconnect Black starting, brown starting is a very complex thing in the energy grid. And now you add information networks that doesn't make things easier. 
should, should be part of the solution as well because it's already part of the problem. And the, and the second part, as I said, is the, the market, the, the, the electrical controls that are now based on the assumption that everything is centralized and you can influence it with very big power stations, which is not the case in the future. I think that didn't answer your question right. <laughs> it was the right direction, I think. <laughs> it was the right direction. Um, yeah, the presentation is more about uh, the, the demand side, the demand response. So I think we have a lot of, of self-organization here at this institute um, with, uh, with the smart grid. So controls, that's one, one part of it. Classical controls, as you might know, react when it's too late. So something goes out of the boundaries and the controller comes and does something about it, yeah? So it already has to be bad to be solved. Predictive controls are different. They have a process model, yeah? Oh, here it is. And you can estimate internal states that you don't even measure. That's a fantastic thing. And you can look into the future because you might have a forecast of, of disturbances of the weather, of the user wishes, of the set points and these things. So you get you stuff that into the MPC controller and the controller then figures out what to do about it. And that's one of the ingredients that we need in the... So that does exist or it's going, hopefully will exist soon, what's your... This exists in avionics, cruise missiles, all the advanced control applications. It is not existing in the energy system. It is not existing in building controls. Um, it's partly existing in the energy system, yeah. It is existing in not in commercial products. Yeah, yeah. Research is done on it. Um, the energy business is very conservative, so they let you knock on their doors for like 20 years until they accept something new, and then you can go inside. We have controllers now in use in Austria commercialized um, this year for the first time and it was eight years of, of lead time. So we made a fundamental re research project, then an applied research project, then a, a laboratory test run, then an isolated test run and now our controller is live in the Austrian grid. But it took us eight years until we convinced the utilities that this thing really works. We are very, very, very conservative which is why these, these modern things are not out there yet. But we believe it's really important to introduce these things. But it's because it's their business, they, they will lose clients if something goes wrong. If something goes wrong, yeah, absolutely. Everybody loses clients when, when something goes wrong. But they are extraordinarily conservative, probably. <laughs> <laughs> which is good. That's why we have energy since 100 years. So don't forget that. <laughs> Yeah. The and then something happens and says, no, I'm not going to buy it anymore. So the, the grid connection, of course. The grid connection is, is, is an exclusive market, so there is a monopoly on the grid connection, but the energy itself so can be bought anywhere. Oh, <coughs> well, that's contracts. I did. <laughs> I, I like to be online all the time. I don't, I don't think it's so flexible. Um, the, the demand it's in the contract. So if you have, capacity. if you have an expensive business, um, yeah, you, can change you certainly have a contract for that. Like I know it from from a company in in Vets in in, in, in Styria. They they were having a production facility with robots, and if they have a power outage there's a high probability that these robots get damaged. So they crash somewhere and break. And that would be an ex extremely high loss to them. So they, they told the utility company, if the power is just away for a minute, you will pay like 50 million euros as, as, as a fine. They put it in the contract, yeah? yeah? And, and that is why the company said, if you want to have that reliability, you pay more. And that's how they that's what they do. They have put uh, a SMES there, a sub superconductive magnetic yeah. energy storage. Mm -hmm. You know these container things? Unbelievably expensive, usually only in military applications. 
on, 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 on uh, like every microgrid, and <laughs> I just put it beside the, the 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 factory and said, "That's your insurance that power will not go out." So, predictive controls. Just a very simple example. That's that's what I have on my office building on, on, on the roof. Solar collector, heat exchanger, and then I have a deck system. That's black magic that cools the air with hot water. Don't ask me how it works. Anyway, we, we are allowed to fiddle around with the controls. Yeah? So there are two pumps here. That's the things that we can influence. The efficiency of the heat exchanger and the solar collector depends on the temperature difference here and the, and the mass flow rate and other things. It's quite, quite complex. <coughs> so what we did, first we need a model of the system, physical model. Looks like this, I think that's obvious. Um, that's just one out of 20 pages. So it's a physical model of the heat and mass transfer and very much simplified. So that's the state space equations in a discretized uh, way. Result is the controller is much more relaxed. You see here uh, a change in the, in the radiation and in the ambient temperature. And an ordinary PI controller just freaks out, yeah? It, reacts only on the problem, yeah? The, the predictive control is much more relaxed, so they, they know uh, it's not so bad, it goes away, I can pre-cool and all these things. So that's the natural outcome of a predictive controller. It, it increases the comfort, yeah? <coughs> so you stay much more within your control boundaries. But this is not the only benefit. And I've seen it in your eyes when I showed you this. Everybody was looking here. So you have discovered that within the minimization term of the, of the controller, you have the control variable. So you automatically minimize your energy. The control variable is the pumps, how often they are running, how quick they are running, and this is minimized. So by design, these algorithms, that's just one of the algorithms, automatically minimize your energy. It not only increases the efficiency of the heat exchanger and the, uh, the solar collector, it also minimizes your <coughs> energy usage. So these things are extremely useful. Question? Yep. Um, uh, in your last slide, um, where you showed... Um, that one. Right. Mm -hmm. um, is that really appropriate? Shouldn't we compare it to a PID controller? No, D is never used. Never. Uh, well, it doesn't depend on usage, but on uh, the concept behind that, I think, because um, you have the, the time component in the MPP controller because it's frozen. And you, you would, would get that with uh, the uh, PID controller. Every controller has a time component. The, the derivative part in the PID, the D, is the controller is just much more nervous. So if you, um, oops. The transfer function, I mean in the time domain of a, of, of a, of a P controller, oops. So if something happens, it does this. Eh? The PI does this, and the PID does this. Eh? So that's the D part. PID actually, IPD, let's call it IPD, <laughs> that's P. So you just get this initial kick that is necessary when you have a certain system dynamics, which is not the case in, in buildings. So this, this system is very inert, this doesn't move anything. So that's the, that's the if, you, if you have a controller, And you input that, you get out this. That's a PID answer. And in reality, out there in the field, in the, in the factories, in the buildings, the D thing is something very special. So usually it, all what you find is D is switched off and PI is the only thing. So, 
I believe we're running out of time. How long am I allowed to? As long as there's something good to say. All right. <laughs> so I, I should have stayed at home. Um, all right. So we need the models. So the system models. And, it, and you have seen that's a, a quite simple physical setting. But the, and, and that's already a simplified physical model. And still it's quite difficult. And what you have to do here, you have to multiply big matrices. Huh? Really big. And that really doesn't fit into the controllers anymore. In the, yeah, they, they can't calculate that. And if you have a more complicated system, then it gets even more difficult. So, especially when you're now talking about energy systems, yeah? smart grids, system view. We had a white or a gray box model of our, of our heat exchanger here. So we knew approximately how it works. There are other parts in the system in my office that we don't know how it works. There's a hot water tank, and we don't know how it works. You think you have a pour in hot water and they take it out? No. <laughs> it's a stratified layered tank with several inlets, and we don't know how many, and so that changes the dynamics, and we don't know how it... So that's uh, getting into a black box model, more or less, because we're identifying the system from outside without looking inside. So we will not have these white and gray box things always. Actually, we will never have them. So we have to work with black box systems, and that's much more difficult, especially when you take into consideration what types of elements we have in the, in the energy system. Yeah? We have the physics, um, the power lines, the transformers, the power stations, the loads, and all these things. We have the IT, controls, communications, market platforms. We have roles, the customers, the DSO, the TSO, um, maybe autonomous thermostats that act like an agent for you, on behalf of you. And we have statistical phenomena that we are either too lazy to model or not capable of modeling, or it's really statistical, like, like the weather and, and the people and, and these things. So these four um, types of elements need to be part of our model if we want to use model predictive controls and other control paradigms in our energy system. Unfortunately, they don't like each other. Yeah? These four things, they don't fit together. They uh, make troubles. In addition, we have a multi-scale problem. So we have very small and very large parts in the system, very quick and very slow parts. It's a stiff system, so the time constants are very different. And that's the reason why we are not that far. Currently, we are playing around with different use cases that contain parts of these elements, parts of these problems. A simple one, we have a, a, a continuous domain, which is a heating system here. Where is it? Here, a heating system. So we have a thermal flow, that's the red one. And we have an information flow over a market that reacts on a consumption and issues a price. And the price is interpreted by some agent that has then an influence on the controller and then controls the thermal flow. So you have two domains inside. Huh? Uh, uh, actually, three. The physical domain, which is the red part, um, a discrete, discrete domain out of the digital controller here. Huh? That's just switching. And you have roles. The role is very simple because it's just one stupid agent and one, uh, yeah, some agents and one market. Yeah? So we are combining these three domains and, and had a look how easy is it to model it in different tools, how performant is the simulation, and how reliable are the results. We didn't know before. We are doing many, many other use cases. So this one, for instance, adds a power station. So in the previous example, the, the power was just there, came out of nothing. Here it comes from a non-ideal power station. So you have a generator with a, with a rotating mass. <coughs> you have a, a governor that uh, controls it. And, and uh, so this is a, an, a real power station. The grid itself, the electric grid, is still ideal here. So there is no topology, no losses, and, and, and these things. So bit by bit, we are adding other things, like, like a communication network, like a thermal grid, and, and these things. To to figure out how our tools can, can cope with that. 
And what we've done up to now is we tried two different modeling philosophies. The first one is agent-oriented, so you have autonomous entities that represent parts of the system. Yeah? They can synchronize each other, and the, the powerful part is they can determine by themselves when they want to be updated, when they need to exchange information with other parts. This is why they are so good. And the second part is the, <coughs> the beautiful one. <laughs> you have uh, powerful languages to describe the system in equations and in other things. So it's maybe more sustainable in documentation and these things. And then you have one monolithic <laughs> solver that works on it. Yeah? So examples would be the Modelica language or Simscape. So th that's what we tried, just to figure out who is, who is better and who does what. The agent tools, they were quick, that was good. So they had a high performance. They, they are extendable somehow. Um, they have hierarchies, which we liked. And they were good in, in looking into the model. They, were, they had good communication facilities inside the model so you can observe the states. On the other side, the physics were not easy to model. So the, the high-level physics was uh, a bit uh, difficult. And especially the example of grid lab D that we used is written in C and it's not written good. So if you want to live with that, you can also book your permanent psychotherapist that sits beside you, that takes care of you, that you don't freak out. <laughs> it's really challenging. But it's a very important tool. I don't know how many millions of dollars went into that. The other um, group of tools, the monolithic ones, we used uh, Simscape from MathWorks and uh, Daimola from Dassault Systems. And the, the good thing was very convenient, beautiful languages, graphical thing, yeah. So I think less errors that you can do because it's just more mm, strong typing, strong syntax and, and these things. So. Multi-domains very easily, so adding mechanics and rotation and thermal and electric is no problem. Good documentation. The problem was the performance. <laughs> it was really slow. It, they are invented for simulating one piece of equipment, like a battery or uh, an engine or something like that, but not systems of our scale. Huh? And most of them are closed platforms from commercial companies I mean, MathWorks is dominating engineering tools. Daimler from Dassault, it's, well, they are, they're a weapons company, actually. <laughs> yeah, shouldn't buy from them anyway. So we had a problem with the, with the platforms. So there are open platforms as well, like Open Modelica that we are currently evaluating. We are more or less happy with it. But yeah, that were the, the cons. And we had a look. Mm -hmm. uh, the first category where GridLabG is in, or other tools, um, that would be something that would be for system modeling, and the other one more for control modeling. Absolutely so right. Yeah. Control is involved because if you have any sort of discrete or intelligent control with controllers that, that are communicating to each other, sometimes how do you put that into a monolithic model? Um, but yeah. I, mean, I, I can see that for if you if you do uh, if, you, if you simulate the internals of a battery with a uh, couple hundred cells or something like that, then that's definitely different. <coughs> models. I'm just a bit confused at the comparison because they're kind of totally different mm -hmm. um, sectors. Yeah, we, we, we're just desperate. We try, <laughs> we try everything. <laughs> we're just desperate. Now, I mean, MATLAB, Simulink, they claim that they are also for the systems domain and they are simulating wind parks and all these things. But if you look at the de details, uh, it's selected yeah. examples for their architecture. Um, you're right, these two things are in a nutshell for systems and for components, that's where they are good in. And in the end, you will see, we're trying to get the best of both worlds by combining them somehow. Which is also not easy, but again, we are full of hope. <laughs>
to be disappointed in the end again. No, uh, we, are, we are quite positive on this. So comparison, don't take that picture too serious. I, I made it in the train in the night when I came here, um, but it's based on real simulations that I have in the end. Um, so grid lab D was very good, at least in use case one, but that was an unfair comparison because the physical parts were not interacting. So they were not connected over a physical channel. Physical channel would be the electric grid, for instance. So if you do something here, the other one can feel it. Yeah? Or if the radiation of one building would hit the other one from the heating, then, then it would be a physical connection. That was not the case, so you could individually solve them analytically, the differential equations, put them into C code, simulate them, period. So that's why GridLab D was really excelling in this, in this first test. The others were really, um, really uh, uh, slow. We have here uh, Daimola and GridLab D, and Simscape is not even in the picture because it stopped right here. <laughs> So it was not even capable of, of simulating that amount of houses. So we have here hundreds of thousands of houses uh, where GridLab D was just fine with, and, and, and Simscape uh, Simulink was pff, calculating for days. So we used that to make experiments, to look into the details, where's the problem, why are they so slow, and. Currently, we have a new candidate that we are quite positive on. As many of you are out of embedded systems, you might know Ptolemy. It's not that young anymore. It comes from embedded systems uh, uh, from the University of California in Berkeley. Professor Lee and his team worked on that. And one sunny day, they figured out that it's also good for simulation. And it's very good in that. So you can model systems in hierarchies. Every hierarchy has a, it's, an, it's a multi-agent based thing, so it's more in the agent corner. Every hierarchy and every mm, you know, bubble has a, has a director who takes care of the timing, the synchronization of these things. There are continuous directors and discrete directors, so these two mm, domains are explicitly part of the design of the tool, which is good, which is not the case with most of the other tools. And you can have discrete and continuous parts in there. They can continue, they can, and the most important thing is it's multi-core able. So you, 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 we can use parallel computation, which was not possible with the other tools. And that's something that we really need. We, we will invest all that we have in simplifying models, sensitivity analysis and then all these optimization things that the models run quicker, but we also have to just invest in, in flops on these things. And if it doesn't support that, uh, we're gonna have a problem anyway. And it's open source and the people are nice and everything. So we are quite positive on this. Um, we will spend the rest of the year playing around with that. So hopefully at the end of the year we know more, how good it is, how happy we are with it. What's that? What specific use case are you looking for simulation tool for? We, are, we have several applied use cases mm -hmm. um, that are, the AIT is an applied research institute, inspired by projects that we have. For instance, in Salzburg, we have, uh, that's the, the smart grids model region in Salzburg. Yeah? And our 60 smart grid guys are permanently busy doing, busy doing something there. And one of the projects is called HIT. Uh, it's the abbreviation of Häuser als interaktiver Teilnehmer, where we first, so buildings as interactive uh, participants in, in the smart grid, where we for the first time are constructing buildings in a way that they are grid friendly. You know? Normally you go there, and we also have another project that does exactly that, you go there and change the controls, put an agent inside uh, uh, that communicates with the others and communicates with the grid operator, to make the, the, the building more grid friendly. But it's limited in its possibilities. Now we build new buildings that have more thermal inertia and other heat pumps and all these things that we actually want in buildings to be more grid friendly. And they have a thermal grid. They have a combined heat and power station there. They have a couple of renewables and it's a community. 
Yeah? And that is one of our use cases. We take that as an inspiration. If we would have our tool already, we could use it in that project and let it search for an optimum. Optimal size, optimal piping, uh, control algorithms and all that stuff. We, we don't have it unfortunately, but we use that as a use case and say, what would we need to efficiently model the, the heat network, to efficiently model the grid and the components and all these things. So we take these examples out of the daily business to, to guide us in what direction it goes. So these are, and some of, some of the use cases are totally nuts. So we, are just, we just make them up. And they're more, they're the more creative ones with uh, swarm energy resources and these things. But yeah. So that's what we will do in the next couple of months. Uh, we try to combine existing tools because they, are, they have these great libraries. If we would like start and re-implement all the libraries that are in Power Factory and, and uh, all the other domain tools, it would take us many, many years to implement them. So we, we have to include existing tools and we have to inc include the, the, the new universal ones like, like Modelica-based tools for new components. We're trying to follow standards as much as possible. There are some emerging ones like FMI and HLA, functional mockup interface and high level architecture. They are very abstract or very bloated versions of co-simulation interfaces that we are trying to use. That would have the, the advantage that we can simply plug in the individual tools, like Daimler has an FMI interface, believe it or not. So we could just plug it in afterwards if our, if our middleware talks FMI. And we try to have it as parallel as possible. So this is the investment in the, in the computational power. And we also have to invest into brain power to figure out methodologies how to model these systems so that they can be simula simulated efficiently. Because the point is if, we, if you're doing a parametric search and you need to simulate the system 50,000 times yeah, to optimize and search for the right combination and one simulation run takes a week, then no way. So we have to figure out what is important, what can we cut away, where can we make boundaries that we can run it on different nodes. And we have some ideas. Um, we already have a quite substantial simulation group and simulation data center in the AIT where we already use these tricks and our group is just trying to get all that together to make it a, a more holistic and organized uh, method. So my last slide, the load side, what is the intelligent load side? So what is intelligent on, on intelligence actually? First you need knowledge and yeah, you need knowledge and, and, and smart decisions in the end. The, the knowledge means that the load side knows about itself and about the rest of the world. Like we. We, we would not be intelligent if we wouldn't know about ourselves and, and the others. That's uh, an absolutely necessary condition. So it needs process models, otherwise it cannot optimize itself. It needs communication capabilities to exchange. Uh, with some master, with some market, with some other members in the system. And the decisions, once you have the knowledge, you of course have to do something smart about it. And the question is, how does that scale? Are there any scalability limits or stability limits, like with the 50.2 hertz thing? And uh, we try to integrate things that we know that they work, like model predictive controls and other algorithms, multi-agent based negotiations and, and these things. But many of them are not formally verifiable, so you can't say if they really converge, if they really find peace and quiet in a certain maximum time. So that's another application for the simulation platform. You have to just try it out and give a statistical 
uh, answer to that question that you see in our simulations in 99.999% of the cases it was finding its equilibrium. That's not 100% uh, of course, but yeah, it's at least a number. So IT is in this case part of the, the problem because it adds states to the system and this is by definition an increase of complexity. It's a big state machine that is difficult to describe and there are losses and you know. But it can be part of the solution as well if you do it right. So in the controls and in the simulation and in the models we need IT to cover these problems. And what we see currently is a big need in, in, in research and modeling. Um, communication is more or less solved. It's a question of price and availability, but yeah. But modeling is totally, yeah. there, there are so many white spots that we really try to encourage people and maybe it happened today to join with whatever input you can, you can give to that big thing. Uh, we are more from the energy part, machines and, and, and transformers and inverters and these things in modeling. But we need partners in modeling these systems of systems because <laughs> that's a, a buzzword, the system of systems where you have, for instance, the energy system connected to the market system yeah? and policies and demographics and whatever, public psychology. So all that is interlinked with different timing, of course, but it has an influence on the oil price and the oil price on the birth rate and the birth rate on the development of the country in the next decades and so on. Simulating that is, of course, even much more complicated than the things that, I'm, that I was telling today, but we have to slowly come there. There were attempts of these systems of systems uh, simulations already. Uh, I know some of them, but the funny thing was they were implementing these things for years, many years with lots of money and experts came from all the world, all over the world and they were adding their domain knowledge to the system. Said, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna add now the, the mechanisms in the Middle East because of the oil and made a model and added, yeah. Another one was adding something else. And now the system, <laughs> You, you can now make a, a forecast of, of energy development over decades and you get some curves and nobody in the world can, can tell you if this curve is real, if it contains any information or if it's just a numerical problem or if there's a pro programming error somewhere. Nobody can tell you that because it's so complex. So the developers are not really happy. It's unusable <laughs> basically. What you would need is a very structured simulation platform where I can disable things, where I can replace them with a simple lookup table, eliminating all these uh, feedback loops to look at phenomena isolated. So you have an expert that understands two domains, which is already fantastic, but the rest must be disabled. And then you can play around until it's verified and validated and everything and it can add another pattern. But they are not capable of doing that because it's one big blob of code. I mean, is this a public domain? Is it accessible? Or? Um, this tool that I'm talking now, it doesn't belong to the AIT, so I, 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 I don't want to name it now. I don't want to talk bad about it. <laughs> well, can you try it out? Can you break copy break? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, well, it's, it's not in the controls domain, the thing that I was having in my mind now, it's more in the strategic planning over the decades of, of energy systems. So it doesn't, it doesn't answer my, my questions anyway because I, I'm more interested in the, in the controls. All right, that's it, I hope it was something in for you. So I talked about the load side, what you can do there. Um, that, you, that the loads might need a bit of intelligence to join a more intelligent energy system in the future and that intel intelligence might need models that you incorporate in some local agents uh, that take care of the controls and for this, for the development of that, we need good tools, good simulation and modeling platforms and that's, that's why we're also working on that.
Thank you. Thank you very much.